All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Some black boxes, some faces here. Good to see you all. Um, thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, I just want to note before we get started, before I forget, um, that we're recording this event. So just so you know. Um, and if you don't know, my name is Jose Vergara, and I teach in the Russian section of Swarthmore College. I know we have some people, plenty of people from Swarthmore and nearby, but some others that I recognize and don't recognize from, from elsewhere. Um, and this evening, I'm really delighted to introduce Alex Halberstadt uh, to Swarthmore virtually. Um, as some of you may know and remember, this event was actually going to happen almost a year ago, and then I don't really have to finish that story. Uh, but I'm really, really happy that we can invite and, and host Alex in this new Zoomified world. Um, and just to give you a sense of how things are going to run tonight, um, Alex will be reading briefly from his family memoir, Young Heroes of the Soviet Union. Um, then Bob Weinberg from History at Swarthmore will offer some questions and we'll have a, a discussion for a little bit. And after that, we'll have plenty of time for audience Q&A. So I hope you have questions. Um, and throughout the conversation, throughout the reading, if anything comes to mind, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, we'll get to it at the end. Um, I also wanted to mention, for those of you who are on campus, students or not, um, I have a box full of this book, a number of copies. Uh, we had bought um, copies to give away at the event last uh, last March. And then when that didn't happen, they've just been sitting in a box in my office. So if you'd like a copy, let me know. I'm happy to, to get it to you somehow. Um, so you can email me if you have my email or if you look it up, or if you want to send me a private message in the chat, I'll, I'll take note. Um, just send me a message with your email address and we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, there's a bunch. So really don't be shy about claiming a copy. Um, I'm sorry that Alex won't be able to, to autograph, but here we go. Um, and before we begin, again, Alex will read and then there'll be a brief conversation and then q and I just want to introduce our two speakers very briefly. Um, Alex Halberstadt is the author of the award-winning Lonely Avenue, The Unlike Unlikely Life and Times of Doc Pomus. hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, his writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Travel and Leisure, GQ, and The Paris Review. He's a two-time James Beard Award nominee and a recipient of fellowships from the McDowell Colony in Yaddo and lives and works in New York. And his interlocutor tonight is uh, Robert Bob uh, Weinberg, uh, who is Isaac H. Clothier Professor of History and International Relations and Department Chair at Swarthmore College. Um, Bob teaches a variety of classes, which students absolutely love about Europe and Russia since the 18th century with a particular emphasis on social movements, revolutionary junctures, and the Jewish encounter with modernity. Um, his research interests have centered on revolution and anti-Semitism in Russia and the Kremlin's policies toward Soviet Jews in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, so there's a lot of overlap with Alex's book and family history, which I think is super fascinating. Um, Bob has a number of books. I don't know if you want me to read them all out, Bob, but there's plenty. <laughs> Maybe we can just dive on in. No need, no need. All right, okay. But just know you should read Bob's work and you can find it. So with that, Alex, if you wanna get started with the reading. Thank you, Jose. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm, thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be doing this at Swarthmore. Um, and I'm so excited to be talking to Bob, whose research interests uh, kind of overlap so nicely with mine. Uh, as you can guess, this has been an interesting year in which to have a book out. <laughs> Not exactly what I what I had envisioned, but you know, but that's true for pretty much everyone in the world. So I feel like I have good company. So as Jose said, I'd like to read uh, for about ten minutes from um, my book. Uh, Young Heroes of the Soviet Union, and then I, I look forward to the conversation. So just to set this up a little bit, this is a scene uh, that takes place in 2007. Uh, basically, it takes place in a Ukrainian city called Venetia. It's in the middle of the country. And I traveled there um, to meet my grandfather for the first time. My grandfather's name is Vasily. He was in his younger years, 
uh, a bodyguard of Joseph Stalin, also a major in the KGB. Um, he's 93 in this scene. I'm 35, and we are meeting for the first time. This is literally three days after I had met my grandfather for the first time. This is my father's father. And the other character who appears later in the book is Sonia, who is his, uh, who is his third wife, who is 82. And um, uh, so um, I'll begin. On our last day together, Vasily told me about the girl. I could tell he'd been saving it, waiting, not sure he wanted to let it go. The story took place in Moscow in 1943. It was the worst year of the war, and the city was a place I can scarcely imagine. Lead-colored barrage balloons, protection from German pilots hovered above the Kremlin, and a decoy village of hammered-together plywood occupied Red Square. The streets were half deserted. The city was mired in a perpetual brownout. Bread, electricity, and gas were rationed, but factories operated through the night. A woman or a man of working age who missed a day on the job received the mandatory prison sentence of five to eight years. And even prisoners were taken to their offices and assembly lines six days a week to work 12 hour shifts before being returned to their cells. Sirens howled through nights, I'm sorry, sirens howled during nightly air raids. Residents slept on tiled floors in subterranean metro stations. Radios were confiscated. Military law was in effect. In 1943 in Moscow, 12-year-old children were summarily executed for stealing bread. On an overcast afternoon, Vasily was riding in the back of a black limousine, one of the armored packards that Stalin lavished on his deputies. Civilian cars were a rare sight, and pedestrians along the embankment stopped to watch it pass. The limousine slowed near the entrance to Borodino Bridge. A girl was walking quickly on the sidewalk, she looked as if she were hurrying home. Vasily recalled that she appeared to be 16 or 17 and was slender and tall with a round face and auburn bangs. The car pulled to the curb and coasted for a time beside her. A driver in a colonel's uniform leaned out the window and called to her. The Packard rolled to a stop. The girl approached shyly and bent down to peer into the automobile's dark interior. The man inside the car who studied her with the most interest was bald and pale. He wore a nondescript uniform and a pince-nez over acute, intelligent eyes. Not yet a full-fledged member of the Politburo, First Deputy Lavrenti Beria, Commissar General of State Security, and Warden of the prison system known by the acronym GULAG, was nonetheless the most feared person in the country. The men unnerved the girl, but as she backed away, a 300 pound Armenian who had gotten out of the limousine, a deputy of Beria's named Kabulov, enfolded her. He lifted her off her feet and tossed her headfirst into the car as easily as she were a bundle of firewood. All of this took no more than several seconds. No one on the sidewalk stopped. Vasily sat in the back seat, the youngest of the men in the Packard he had been borrowed from Stalin's detail. The secret police chief enjoyed befriending Stalin's bodyguards, Vasily told me, an expression of his contempt for their boss, Stalin's slow-witted major domo, Nikolai Vlasic. Vasily was taking his first ride with Beria. He knew he was being tested. He sat in the back seat and watched the girl's frightened, rapidly moving eyes. The limousine traveled to a mansion in Malay Nikitska Street that had belonged to the Tsarist General Kurapatkin. Inside, servants had laid out a Georgian, a Georgian feast, roast mutton, satsivi, bottles of red wine. Beria's men sat around the table laughing, getting drunker. Vasily stood in the corridor and watched. There was one of the commissar's senior bodyguards, Sir Kisav or Nadaria, he didn't remember which, the enormous Kabula of a few others he didn't know, and at the head of the table, Beria himself, picking at the eggplant, completely sober. They'd nearly forgotten about the girl when Kabula waddled in and hoisted her onto the table, sending a plate crashing to the floor. Somewhere in the bowels of the house, a Chopin waltz warbled on a gramophone. The girl stood frozen until Kabula gave her a shove and she began to sway slightly to the music. 
Lucille recalled that she still had a child's face that had reminded him of his younger sisters. He watched the awkward striptease, the Georgians jeering and laughing, and he dug his fingernails into his palms because he wanted to shout, to upend the table, to unholster his gun and shoot into the air. But he stood in the corridor and watched one of them carry the girl upstairs. Beria stood, draped his napkin over the back of his chair and walked after them. Vasily knew the girl wouldn't return home or be seen again. I just stood there, he said, watching. Vasily related the end of the story looking straight ahead without even a glance in my direction, his jaw turning hard at the mention of her. Just then he looked less guarded than I'd seen him. The performative air is forgotten. The mild sunken cheeked face of the 93 year old shut in took on its former severity. It was nearly 10 o'clock. The only sounds were the ticking of a clock and outside Vasily's apartment, the ratchet like whir of a trolley. The headlights of passing cars fluttered across the ceiling, first yellow, then red, then a washed out pink. Vasily and I sat across a table and took each other's measure. I sensed the weight of everything he had concealed or left unsaid, everything he would take with him. Its presence was palpable between us. I traveled 5,000 miles to meet this man, almost certainly Stalin's last living bodyguard, this man who happened to be my grandfather, unwittingly thinking of myself as an amateur map maker of his life. I imagined decoding his roles as perpetrator and victim, trying to piece together and weigh his motives, charting his involvement in decades old events. I realized how naive I'd been. His culpability was an immense, unknowable continent filled with indecipherable ambiguities. Vasily had merely permitted me into the vestibule of his past. I was realizing too that Vasily's role in these events affected all of us who were connected to him. My, mother, my father had to nourish himself on the leavings of humanity Vasily brought home and on his frightening past. He cut off his communication with this man partly to shield my mother and me from his past. This, I understood finally, was history, not the ordered narrative of books, but an affliction that spread from parent to child, sister to brother, husband to wife. It took my grandmother Tamara from Vasily, Vasily from my father, and my father from my mother and me. 50 years after his death, Stalin, the scarecrow of black and white newsreels, had reached into my life too. Vasily's wife, Sonia, stood listening in the kitchen. All night I could tell she wanted to say something. And I wanna, when I walked to the stove to pour myself a cup of tea, she beckoned me into a corner out of Vasily's earshot. When I was 12, my mother was arrested, she said, her hand on my arm. She owned a farm and was denounced by a neighbor. My father ran away. My brother was nine. The orphan just didn't admit children of enemies. So for three years, we lived in the street begging. Then a pious Orthodox family took us in. And then one day they heard my brother singing a Soviet song he'd learned in school and they made us leave. Two years later, my brother was killed at the front. She looked out the window at the empty sidewalk. Sometimes I hate this country, she said, with a fervor that made tears well up in her eyes. Out in the living room, Vasily was eating a piece of cake, oblivious to our conversation. They had been married for 35 years. How did she manage caring in her old age for Stalin's infirm bodyguard? We lived in terrible times, Sonia said, guessing my question. All that is left now is to be kind to one another. It was nearly midnight and I told Vasily that I would stop by again tomorrow to say goodbye before catching the train back to Moscow. Sonia handed me a stack of photographs I asked to copy. Keep them, she said or they will just end up in the trash. Before leaving, I sat beside Vasily for a while, studying his face, trying to remember everything that had been said earlier. When I told him goodnight, he grasped my hands and didn't release them until we were alone. And his face was so close to mine that I could smell his breath. I was frightened every single day, he whispered and let go. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. Okay, uh, that's quite a section to read and I encourage all of you listening in tonight to actually pick up his the book and read it because uh, there are plenty other scenes that are just as moving and revealing about uh, life and death in the Soviet Union. So uh, now, am I correct that it's your mother that joined us, Alex? Um, oh, on the Zoom call? Yeah, I think I, I said Anna. I hadn't looked, but yes, I think. Okay. That would be right. Then I, I will. I won't ask any questions about her in the, in your life. Uh, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so thank you for taking the time to talk with us. I, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about trauma in your memoir, because the prologue to the book begins with your discussion of how uh, scientists, researchers have been finding that trauma can be passed on through the generations, not so much that it's uh, passed down through genetic alterations, but the experiences of one generation could certainly affect how the expression of someone else's genetic makeup could be expressed. So I was just curious, uh, after meeting your grandfather, after talking with your father, uh, and after obviously reflecting upon your uh, grandparent, both sets of grandparents' lives in the age of Stalin, uh, how this how this has do you think has affected you in terms of uh, your ability to uh, respond to challenges in life? In other words, do you feel traumatized as a result of having a grandfather who was privy to what? the reading, your selection, uh, talk about? Thank you for that question. Um, so actually the studies, uh, some of the, the first study in this kind of body of work, which was done at Emory University in Atlanta, came out in 2013 when I was already at work on this book. And it kind of reoriented the book a little bit because I was so struck by the study and what it had essentially and what it was saying about kind of, you know, children and parents and grandparents and the way that they um, essentially carry this trauma from one generation to the next. So essentially it was a study of mice that found that, um, you know, mice who were shocked while, while being smelling a particular aroma uh, would start to tremble. And then they discovered that the same thing was true of their offspring, even though they had never been shocked the aroma would trigger the same trembling and the same fear response in them. And the third generation of mice who were raised in a laboratory across the campus at Emory, who had never even been exposed to their parents or grandparents, they were fertilized in vitro, actually had the same response. And what this seemed to show is that we inherited fear, we inherited trauma, uh, to put it in slightly more conventional terms, genetically, not through the alteration of the genetic makeup, but actually through these markers called uh, uh, genetic markers that are kind of studied in a discipline of genetics called epigenetics. They're called epigenetic markers and essentially they attach themselves to genes through, you know, in, in the course of one's life. Uh, they, we scientists had thought that they were cleared during uh, the birth of a child, but in fact, it turned out that they weren't. And um, several other studies had have come out since, uh, essentially confirming these results, these findings. Uh, most recently, uh, on a group of um, children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, which found that these that this population, even though many of them were raised in this particular study in the United States uh, during peacetime, had a very high propensity from P for PTSD and other sort of trauma related conditions. Uh, and I was really struck by these results because of what it seemed to show was that we didn't just, you know, we didn't just inherit stories from our parents and grandparents. We didn't just inherit, you know, essentially attitudes or, you know, kind of psychological inclinations that we, that we actually inherited the trauma itself uh, in ways that were entirely physiological. And I thought this was really incredible. Um, and what it made me think about was, 
how that applied in my own life, you know, uh, and it sort of started to really inform the writing of this book and kind of rearranged and re, um, resequenced parts of it. And certainly made me think not only about how it affected me, but also what it meant for an entire society of traumatized people, you know, and of course, generations who had lived through the era of Stalin can, you know, I think safely be said to be profoundly traumatized by war, by famine, by collectivization, by, you know, certainly by the, the great terror of Stalin. Um, how, what effect that could have on an entire society. And so the last section of my book was, is really about that. It's about considering how a society responds to trauma uh, in light of these new findings. But to answer your question, <laughs> to answer your short question um, with my long answer, I, I, you know, I, one of the, part of the impetus for writing this book was also trying to think about, you know, my own life and my own attitudes and my own sort of, you know, emotional life because it contained a lot of things that I didn't understand. And, and I can't say that, you know, I think it's a little bit premature to say that I was traumatized by my grandparents' lives. It's tempting, but I think there's, the science isn't quite there to, to support such a statement. I think it's, it's a profoundly interesting question, right? It's, it's really interesting to think of how that history, you know, impinges on our own ability to form relationships, to do work to, you know, feel happy and safe in our lives. So uh, I, I don't think, I, don't think I, I want to come up with a answer, direct answer to your question, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly something I grapple with in the book. No, I appreciate that. that that's, I mean, your discussion of trauma sort of gives new meaning to the notion that we all come with baggage from our parents and families. So, uh, you know, this is a different way of really trying to understand the impact, you know, your parents and your grandparents or your extended family may have on one's life. Elsewhere in the book, you talk about, uh, let me see if I got the quote here, so I, I get it exactly. Uh, okay, so you refer to your grandfather allowing you into the vestibule of his past. And I was just curious, what do you think you would have found had you entered into the you know, dining room, kitchen. The dining room, yeah. In, in real terms, but uh, as a metaphor, and what, what would you hope to find, hoping to find when you tracked him down? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think, I don't, I don't really know what I was expecting, Bob, to be honest, you know. We spent quite a bit of time together, and of course, in a way, I don't blame him. We were meeting for the first time. He, he, kind of didn't know that I existed until a few, a few weeks before our meeting, you know, and he was 93 and clearly he was, you know, I think like most people, he was interested in being liked. He was interested in having me think that he was a great guy. And I had come, you know, being a journalist with this very different agenda. Of mm -hmm. course, I wanted to meet him. I wanted to, you know, restore this kind of family relationship, but I also really needed to know what he had done and what he had lived through. And I, and I kind of really, you know, sunk my teeth into his neck and hung on, you know, during his evasions. And he was very evasive at first and kind of, you know, eventually Sonia, who was his wife, who was this very kind of sweet 82 um, year old lady, she kind of slammed her hand very, you know, kind of, on the table and it kind of shocked both of us. And she said, Vasily, just stop it. Just tell him the truth. And that, that's kind of when he started to really come forth with the real stories. I mean, I think, I think, you know, the, <laughs> to torture that metaphor some more, I, I think in the, in the dining room, there was definitely unsavory things. You know, he had been a major in the KGB. He had, he had worked for the KGB for, um, nine years before becoming a bodyguard and then told me that he had he had had an office in Lubyanka, which is the big KGB prison in and headquarters in Moscow, which is still occupied to this day by the FSB, which are, which is, you know, the new version of the KGB and, you know, had 55 officers report to him. So I think what I would have found was, you know, torture, killing, you know, um, 
certainly th things that were deeply unsavory and awful. You know, I think, uh, I think that's kind of uh, pretty clear from his biography. Um, and of course, he didn't want to talk about many of those things. He, you know, wanted to talk about, you know, listening in on foreigners and, you know, and following tourists around, but clearly a man of his rank in 1937 and 38 and 39 was not doing simply that. He was doing a lot more, which is, you know, beating confessions out of people, uh, which were understood to be false, you know. Uh, interestingly, you know, in Lubyanka at that time, uh, it wasn't a very, the system was very poorly organized. So, uh, you know, there the, the, the were, I think, 12 subterranean level uh, floors below the ground in that building, the lowest of them containing crematoria where bodies were disposed of. And interestingly, th there weren't executioners and there weren't sort of officers. It wasn't like, you know, the, the, a Western justice system. Sometimes the officers you know, were the executioners. Sometimes the, you know, the so-called prosecutors were the executioners. People kind of did a little bit of everything, which, you know, seems to be the case from a lot of the memoirs that I've read and according to Vasily as well. So I think he did a lot of terrible things. I think, you know, I know he participated in the Tartar genocide uh, in, the, in, in the mid forties uh, where over 70,000 people died, you know, which was a terrible, terrible event uh, where the Tatar minority was moved across the country to Siberia. Um, but, you know, I, I guess what I realized as I was scratching the surface, he told me a little bit, and I knew that if I had gotten further, there would be more and more and more. And, you know, and in a way I can only guess at what it is, but, but that's what I think I was getting at, is I wanted to know the entirety of what he had done and he made it clear at one point that that simply wasn't in the cards. He just wasn't going to go there. Because he, did he, I, I, you probably can't answer this and, and also the answer may be very obvious. Did, did you get a sense that he felt ashamed or, re, or regretted what he did? Or he just figures, I don't want to revisit it. I don't want to saddle my grandson that I've just met with this knowledge. Uh, is, I, I understand that may be almost impossible for you to, I mean, it's it's hard to say because I did not find him to be a, an easy to read person. He was not a he's he was just just because he was old did not mean that he was simple. He was actually very complex, mm -hmm. and I I could tell that there was a lot of shame there because I could see it on his face. Uh, but there was also you know his attempts to justify himself. You know he had told me many times that you know he he believed in the mission that that you know he believed he was you know. He said that we, you know, we believe that it was our mission was to cut the rot from the apple's core, you know, to preserve, you know, Soviet society. But of course, he he was too intelligent to really believe that entirely. And I and I think in the in the ensuing years, certainly he learned enough to know that he had been involved in some atrocities, that he had been involved in genocide and torture, you know, uh, because. I think what complicated that story is that so many of his colleagues ended up dead, uh, or disappeared, had committed suicide. You know, his essentially his entire, uh, you know, collegium, uh, all of his fellow officers, bodyguards, most of them by 1953, when Stalin died, were, you know, gone as well. You know, uh, and and he certainly. You know, he certainly was terrified of meeting the same fate. So I think there's an interesting combination of shame and fear and, you know, justification. It, it, it was really difficult to untangle all of these different threads. But, you know, but it was interesting to try to think about what it must, must have been like to be both, you know, a torturer and an executioner, as well as someone who is afraid for his life every single day. You know, the, uh, the secret police where he worked was purged three times in the 1930s. So the fact that he survived at all was kind of impressive in, in a certain way. And, you know, certainly the bodyguards after Stalin's death did not, most of them ended up working in penal colonies. So he had quite an unusual fate. So I think, um, but yeah, in terms of his own feelings, I think, I think they were complex and conflicting and numerous. Great. Right.
Okay, I just want to ask one more question and sort of shift the tone because uh, you have this great scene where you're on a train with your, what could, he's, he was your stepbrother, right? My stepbrother, yeah. Uh, uh, and there are these two men on the train, clearly without tickets and <laughs> a lot of vodka. And it just made me think that one of the, having these kinds of adventures uh, was something that I got used to when I started visiting the Soviet in the 1980s, especially because Americans were forbidden fruits. So when someone realized you were an American, they just had lots of questions. But you know, you just get into these situations that you would never see in the United States. Uh, and I was just curious, even though you're of Russian background, you came as a kid, and certainly you know lots of uh, adults who grew up in the Soviet Union. What was your reaction? How did you understand that? Because uh, if you experience it once or twice, it's just normal. But your first time, I know it's got to be at times more than just a little surprising. Uh, yeah, I mean, th that wasn't my first trip to the Soviet Union since I left. I'd, I'd been back before. Okay. I guess, it was, yeah, and, and this was at this point, the Russian Federation. But yeah, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've returned a lot. You know, my, my dad lives in Moscow, my, my half sister. And also I've, I've gone on plenty of uh, journalistic sort of assignments. And, you know, it's, I, I don't think it's that different now, frankly, you know, that it's Russia. Um, I think getting into adventures is one of the great pleasures of being in Russia, you know, and they're always a little, you know, they're always a little, they can, they, they always carry an element of risk and an element of, you know, kind of, there's always, you're always scraping a little bit, you know, but it's, but they're incredibly fun. I mean, one of the, uh, the particular incident that you refer to, the, yeah, there were these two drunk ex-cons on a train who were traveling without tickets or passports and they sat down next to us in an empty dining car because they wanted to talk and uh and every time the conductor walked through they hid in the lavatory you know they because they were terrified of being caught and take and you know essentially put off the train but you know i think one of the great things about being in russia is you know the ability to you can get to know people so quickly you know uh, you can befriend somebody in minutes you know not just because the culture sort of allows for it it's a, it's a much less cautious culture i think than you know that of the united states or the uk you know and i think it's 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 there's a kind of easy i wouldn't say intimacy but i would say familiarity that you can get with people people tell you their stories much quicker and and i think in a way um you know, getting involved in these unscripted situations, sometimes they can be kind of scary or sometimes, you know, you get involved with characters who, you know, clearly maybe don't mean you very good, you know, they're, they're sort of not the most benevolent characters, but, you know, I, I, I'm comfortable enough in Russia that, that I, you know, I speak the language well enough and know enough of the culture that I can usually pass for a, for a native if I don't open my mouth too much. So, uh, you know, usually I, I, I love wandering around and having these adventures. They are, they probably sound more, I don't know, more scarier and more unsavory than they, than they really are. But I think that's one of the great pleasures of being in Russia. You know, things are so much less controlled and ordered than they are here. And I think part of the pleasure is just kind of sneaking through all of these gaps in the social order and you know, having adventures and doing things that you might not, you know, otherwise. Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's, uh, that's the best thing about being there. At least that's my, my perspective on it. How do you feel, Bob? Well, I, you know, the notion that people, you, so in, in, in public, people are very sort of proper and they don't, they sort of look, look straight through you. Uh, but once you get to meet them in their kitchen or somewhere, they open up and they're very generous. So they seem to have this, these two personas, one in the public where yeah. they're not going to express anything. And then one at home where they're going to treat you as your one of the families. And no, with these adventures, I was there, I was in Odessa just a, you know six years ago. And we had, my friend and I, an American, we had put our suitcases at the train station.
went to pick them up to get on the train to go back to Kiev. And when the man who was giving, running the uh, uh, baggage claim realized that we were foreigners, he started asking us questions. He said, oh, we're Americans. And my friend told a joke or said something funny. He says, I've never heard an American in Russian say something funny. Next thing you know, he called out his two other coworkers. And for 45 minutes, we were having shots of vodka while this line just grew, right? Uh, at a certain point, I just said, you know, we had to catch a train. If I keep doing this, it's going to be very sloppy and I don't want to get too drunk. And so we ended it, but it was sort of like, there we were having, you know, shots of vodka, telling stories and anecdotes. And this line of 30, 40 people just waiting for their suitcases that they paid no attention to them. Yeah. Uh, Everything about that story rings true to me. Yeah. Uh, especially the terrible service. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's, that's very, that's very, very, that, that's, that's very familiar. If, especially vodka is involved, you can really, you know, you can really strike up a great conversation with, with total strangers and it, and it gets very sort of, you know, I'm sure anybody who's been to Russia has probably had that experience somewhere. So. Yeah. I was glad to have that experience because I figured, you know, now 2013 Americans are just, nobody cares about us, but they seem, this guy actually seemed to really want to engage us as Americans. Uh, anyway, why don't we open up for questions from the other people in the uh, Zoom room. And, uh, Jose, I guess we'll monitor that, right? Sure, I can do that. And if you want to raise a virtual hand using the reactions tab in the bottom or put your question in the chat um, or raise your real hand if you have your video on, I'll try to pay attention to that as well. But feel free. Grace. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. I'm curious about the how you approach the balance or the tension between the research process and the, then your role as writing narrative. And in terms of like the stories of the people that you're featuring, to what extent is there a barrier between you and their voices? Or to what extent are you trying to be immersed? And how do you approach that responsibility? Thank you, that's a really, Fantastic question, because that was kind of, you know, really at the heart of writing this book. Um, you know, I, I think, it, you know, this book, as you can probably tell, has a ton of history in it. And, and also a lot of it happens before I was born. So I'm narrating events that I certainly wasn't present for, a lot of which also aren't sort of big historical set pieces, but are personal stories and family stories. You know, my approach to that is, is, you know, I think your first job as a writer is to, to write a compelling story and to keep that story sort of to keep the thematic and dramatic thread kind of going throughout. Because if you lose that thread, the book becomes, it starts to flounder, you know, uh, especially in a book with a lot of moving parts that kind of goes back, telescopes back and forth in time. Um, so... I always try to prioritize the story in the sense of, you know, trying to keep the research to, you know, trying to keep the research relevant, by, by which I mean dramatically relevant, right? Sometimes you read a book, you know, I'm thinking of some historical novels where you can tell somebody had done a lot of research in a period and they sort of present it to the reader on a tray where they go like, I found that I found this and I found that and I found that, you know? And, and I think that always, I always really dislike reading that because I think it always kind of seems showy and it always seems to kind of detract from, you know, the, the action of the book and the kind of thematic thrust of it because you feel like somebody did the research and they want to get their like money's worth in a way, you know? And I think it's always much more interesting to kind of keep those set pieces, you know, pretty closely tethered to, to the, to the sort of foreground. Right. So, in, in nonfiction book, you like, you know, un, unless it's an outright history book, I think you have the foreground, the, the main characters, and then you have the background, which is sort of the large historical events that illuminate them. And then they illuminate, you know, in turn. And I think, I think you have to be really sparing, 
and really restrained with, with, with presenting research and weaving research into the book because otherwise there's this kind of tendency. And I know because I fell into this trap many, many times while writing this book uh, of sort of, you know, doing, presenting these kind of mini, mini lectures to the reader, which, you know, I think is really not a great way to go because they feel, they, they really feel like these kind of gratuitous little oases of information that you're sort of presenting. And I think, so I tried in writing this book to, to be kind of much more, um, you know, much more sort of skeletal in the way that I did it. I always wanted to keep the story in the front and present the, the weave in the research that I thought kind of more immediately impinged on it, right? And kind of put, so there was a lot of research. I, I mean, I took 11 years to write this book and a lot of research ended up on the cutting room floor, you know, because I just, there just wasn't a dramatically appropriate place in the book for it. Um, but I think, so I think it's always a balancing act. And I think it's really, and I think often it's easy to talk about it, but I think you also have to, you know, it, it, it always proves itself in the making, in this case, in the writing, right? You, you write it and you have to see how it works. Uh, it will, you know, I think it either feels relevant or it doesn't, but I think, you know, I think, uh, in a book for a general reader like this one, I think that I always think it's important to err on the side of less is more of, you know, not sort of suffocating the action with research, you know, and keeping that balance sort of a little bit lean. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Of course, thank you for the question. Julia. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for the reading, first of all. Thank you. Um, but I kind of wanted to follow up to Grace's question because I was actually wondering, like, what was your approach to telling the story, which you kind of answered as far as like a lot of the research. But I was really wondering, like, did that approach like change ever? Like, did you ever think like, oh, I want this to be more personal or I want this to be more historical? Did that change when you found more information, especially since you spent like a really long time writing the book? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, you know, it, it it changed constantly. It was it was a constant kind of you know back and forth. Um, you know, in, in the scene that I read, you know, um, that was a scene that my grandfather told me. You know, and then the question became, you know, there was a question as to whether how true it was, right? Because he was a 93 year old man kind of re recalling a story from 50 years earlier, actually 60 years earlier, I guess. And, you know, and it had, it had some major historical figures in it, you know, Beria and Stalin and, you know, and, and, and part of it was really considering how to carry that, right? Because I could have sort of been a journalist and said, this is the story he told me and this part checked out and this part didn't check out, you know, and sort of do it like that, almost like, like, you know, a professional historian might, or present the story as a story, kind of in the context of him telling me the story rather than paraphrasing him uh, entirely. And then sort of later on going on and, and kind of writing about trying to figure out the veracity of it, you know, consulting two experts, two, two historians who specialized in sort of Stalin era stuff and really trying to figure out whether the story was true. So there was a constant tension between, you know, where do I fit into the story? Am I, you know, am I, am I presenting, am I supposed to vet this, you know, the way a historian might, am I supposed to just present it as, as, as an event? Um, so I found, I, I know I'm, I'm not exactly answering your question, but I guess I'm trying to say that I found that balance very difficult and I found that at times really confusing because I think, you know, it's one thing to write about the personal lives of your family because that's essentially kind of in that category of things that don't really impact other people, right? Not, or not too many other people, right? Uh, but but when, you're, when you're writing about events that had kind of large historical reverberations, you know, there suddenly becomes this question of how much do I owe the reader? Am I supposed to be a historian? Am I just telling a story about people that I know? Um, so that kind of, 
Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm not doing a great job of actually answering your question, but I guess that, yes. So to, to answer it better, that relationship did constantly change, you know, because um, there was a temptation to become too familiar and too personal with narratives that happened to my grandparents, for example, long before I was born. And I realized at some point that I couldn't do that, that that felt, eventually that felt wrong, you know, to narrate their thoughts, to talk about what they thought and felt. Um, also, my background is as a magazine writer. I, I, this is my second book, but I do a lot of, uh, a lot of journalism for places like the New York Times Magazine. And, you know, I think in magazine writing, there's a certain kind of humor and a certain kind of, you know, uh, there's a certain kind of writing that's much showier, that is much more sort of, you know, more antic, more, you know, um, more fun in a way. And tonally that takes a lot more kind of, you know, gonzo turns where you can make jokes, you can sort of uh, play with the writing. And in this book, I really realized that I couldn't do any of that. I couldn't use any of those tricks that I learned in journalism because I had to really restrain the tone of this book and make it very matter of fact, which is very much unlike other things that I've written, simply because I think the story here had to take priority over, you know, whatever, whatever stylistic kind of things I was interested in doing. And really, I had to let the story tell itself and, and really kind of, you know, essentially take on all the significance here. Uh, and for a long time, I really struggled to kind of di un dis disentangle my sort of style in a way from the story. And, and I th and I think so. I think this is actually quite different from anything I've written. And really, it kind of forced me to learn how to write a different sort of book and write a different sort of narrative. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think if you look at my journalism, you'll find it to be very, very different than than what I've written here. And part of that was also just trying to you know, square my, square my position as a narrator in a story that covers so many years and that touches on so many things and really be making it much more matter of fact, much more in a way, um, yeah, much more restrained than, than something I thought I was going to write when I started writing this book. Is that that's a little a slightly tortured answer, I know, but does that get no, it? No, that, that, that definitely answered my question. I think like just like hearing like I guess that it wasn't such an easy, straightforward process. No, like not at all. Yeah, like that that definitely answered it. So thank you. Cool. I'm glad. Thank you. Liam. Hi. Um so you mentioned like sort of beginning the process of your book, and I wanted to ask how how you would describe that because like so many of these projects just seem like you know like like massive undertakings you said it was 11 years long um the process of writing this book so how does how does sort of the whole thing get off the ground uh, thanks for that question um it, it actually began with um strangely enough with the magazine story i was talking to a friend of mine who was a writer uh who wrote for um, who was a writer at GQ and I, we were having a drinks one night and uh, 15 years ago. And I told him that I had a grandfather who had been Stalin's bodyguard. And he said, well, have you ever written about that? And I said, no. And he said, well, you know, and I, at that point I was just beginning as a journalist. I was, you know, kind of coming into it from a slightly different career. And he said, well, you know, I think anybody would really be interested in reading that. And I said, oh, really, you think so? And the next day his editor called me and said, do you want to do the story for us? Do you want to go to Ukraine and find your grandfather and, and write what happens? We'll send you. And, and I said, sure, because, you know, it was just, it was a way to do this that was manageable that I could afford. You know, I was very much sort of like a struggling, struggling writer at that point. And, and I really, so I took this opportunity and it became a magazine story. Uh, but as but as I was doing the assignment, as I was essentially um, interviewing my grandfather and then writing the story, I realized that there were all these other things that I hadn't expected to find. Because what I had realized wasn't just that I had this grandfather who had, you know, done some terrible things and, you know, seen some 
you know, historical events, what I realized is that I had essentially misunderstood my family. I had understood, misunderstood what, you know, the entire dynamics of my family, because, you know, I had this difficult relationship with my father and I suddenly realized that his relationship with his father was completely terrible because his father, you know, by virtue of doing his job was just kind of an emotional cipher, you know, and that a lot of the events in my family that I thought had to do with personality and, you know, feelings and, you know, kind of these very personal things were in fact completely historical that, that in fact that our family was shaped by his by history much more so than they were shaped by you know how people felt about one another you know and of course as i learned more about my family i realized that was true not only for my father but for my mother as well whose parents both barely survived the holocaust and had lost their entire families in concentration camps and ghettos so it kind of you know really made me curious about this relationship between the personal and the historical, right? That that actually those two things, especially in a place like the Soviet Union, which saw so much calamity and so much war and so, so much sort of, you know, terror, that, you know, those things were in fact far more decisive in, in choosing, in, 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 in sort of predetermining what kind of family you had and what kind of person you were and how you felt about your life uh, than, than I had ever actually ever considered. And of course, when the, finally, when the epigenetic study came out, that really kind of cemented that idea in, in, a, in a really concrete way. So it kind of grew out of a magazine article, but eventually kind of, you know, grew into this larger thing because I realized that the story I wanted to tell wasn't just my grandfather's story. It was the story of my family, but really, it was an opportunity to tell the story of the Soviet Union through seven people. And I always found that, that history is really much more exciting when it is made personal, when it's conveyed in you know, personal specifics, not in these kind of the generalities of textbooks, right? So that's kind of how the, the book came about. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Liam, for that question. Um, Elizabeth, we'll get to you, but if I could use my host project host powers. To, host powers to ask a, a quick follow-up there. Um, I guess one aspect of the book that hasn't come up is your story and how you integrate your experience um, growing up in the United States primarily. Um, so I'm curious, sort of following up on this previous question and answer, at, at what point did you decide to incorporate yourself and how did you, like what, what differences are there about between writing about your grandfather and, and your family and then writing about yourself was that what challenges did that present yeah th thanks for that question jose uh, i think that was you know one of the really the hardest parts of the book because generally the difference between my grandfather my grandparents stories and my stories is that my story happened during peacetime you know and it was a lot less dramatic you know i mean and so the challenge was how do you write a book in a tone that encompasses somebody, you know, being Stalin's bodyguard and then, you know, and then escaping from Hitler and, you know, li living through World War II and, you know, watching kind of these incredible events, un life and death events unfold on a mass scale. And then, you know, picking up the story in New York City in the 1980s when I was, an, you know, a kid and, and an immigrant. And I think that had to, that was really difficult because. I didn't know how to essentially write the book in a tone that honored all of those kind of registers of drama, right? Um, and, and I think that also had to, I think the solution had to do with the fact that, you know, the only parts of my story that I put in were the ones that seemed thematically bound to the rest of the story. So one solution was really figuring out what this book was about, what that, the, what the thematic spine of it was, because it couldn't just be a bunch of stories. It had to, it had to be about something. And of course, in the end, it became about this idea of inheriting, of inheriting trauma, of inheriting essentially the lives of people who came before us and how those, and how we hold those events in our own lives, right? And not just in the sense of, you know, feeling traumatized, but really in terms of what those events mean 
what does it mean to kind of, you know, live through life in this country and then leave that country and come to another country, you know, where the value system and, you know, essentially the things one aspire to are completely different, right? Um, so, you know, so, so the, the spine of this book was always history and kind of our relation to that history at, at any point in our lives, right? Um, the sense that, it, that we were, that history was always essentially with us, even when we were in the, you know, even many years later, you know, and how, how, it, might, how it unfolds in our lives and in the way that we, you know, become adults. Um, so that was one thing. And the other thing, again, had to do with restraint. It had to do with using a tone that was essentially didn't ever try to amplify the drama, right? Because it's easy to kind of tell stories where people are getting killed and, you know, to, and really try to sort of, you know, fan those flames. And I think what I had to come, what I had to find was a tone that was essentially really just the facts, right? That was, that, that really allowed the story just to exist without any amplification, without any, you know, fanning of the flame, you know, to, to just let it, to just leave it alone. And essentially, so it, for me, I, I, I think I had to find a tone that was, that just had extreme restraint in it and, and sort of, you know, an ability to tell the story without too much imposition of my voice onto it, you know, to kind of let the facts breathe and let them, you know, uh, and not try to work them up, you know, into a frenzied state. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but, it, but, but there's a kind of, you know, I, I think I think when you're writing about really horrifying events, you you as a writer, it's always a, a good policy to just let the story, just tell the story. Don't you know? Don't don't you know? Be the, the pitch man for those events. Don't you know? Hype them. Just let them let them tell their own story. Let respect the reader enough to allow them to be moved just by the story. You don't have to work. Uh, as a writer to try to persuade them, you know, or use rhetoric, just, you know, if, if you write with enough detail and enough richness, I, I you know, I think that the, the, the meaning and the emotional significance of the story will come through. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought it worked <laughs> for me. Um, in that third section, there's, about your own story and your own experiences, and um, there are you know things that were moving, but also the funnier or lighter parts. Um, and, and for me, you know, I immigrated from Colombia at a young age, similar to you. And I saw some parallels, at least, and it resonated with me on, on, a, glad, on a key yeah. level there. Yeah, um, and I also thought it was just super important to have lighter parts because so, so much of the book is heavy, you know, that I, I wanted there to be some, you know, some lighter parts, some parts that weren't, you know, about, you know, troops marching, you know, that, yeah. that, that, that were just a little bit, a little bit quieter and funnier. But I'm, I'm glad it resonated. Elizabeth. Hi, thank you so much for giving this talk. I have a couple questions about your experience with meeting your grandfather. So understandably, as a journalist, you would want to like get to the bottom of his story and find out like the intricacies and details. But I was wondering if on some level you didn't want to know everything or perhaps some of the darker parts you didn't want to know about. And then secondly, was there an emotional impact on you as a result of finding, about, finding out about your family's past? And I suppose that could relate to your ideas about um, inherited trauma as well. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that question. Um, I, I think um, that I want to get to the bottom of it. Um, yes, I, I mean, as a journalist, I definitely wanted to learn as much as I could. Um, on the other hand, you know, there was a part of me that wanted to, you know, I was finding a grandfather, you know, I was finding a member of my family that I'd never met. And, you know, what surprised me is, you know, my father really hated him. Uh, my father hated his father and you know partly it was because he was a really bad father but partly it was also because my father you know loved 
rock music and American movies, and he hated Stalinism. He he was deeply ashamed of the fact that his father had been, you know, a Stalinist and a member of the of the secret police. You know, he thought this was absolutely terrible, and he was very ashamed of that. So I, I think part of the surprise for me was how much I liked my grandfather. That he wasn't this monster. That he was actually a smart, well spoken, you know, interesting guy. And a part of me, you know, wanted him to turn out to be like a really great guy, you know. But of course, I was also there in two capacities, right? One as a journalist, one as a family member. So yeah, there was it was really conflicting because, and also he really made it hard. He really didn't want to tell me this stuff. So and and at times he sort of kind of gave me. He was like, you know, are you here to interrogate me? And so a part of me really felt bad for him, like. Why am I putting him through this? So yeah, it was it was really tough. It was really difficult to. Sometimes I thought I was being really cruel. Like like, what right do I have to just show up in this guy's life and be like, tell me everything about your life, everything that you did, and I want I want you to tell me all the things you're ashamed of. You know, that's that's a lot to ask, basically a stranger who's ninety three years old, right? So yeah, I mean, sometimes being a journalist is really unsavory. Because you're basically manipulating people into giving you what you want. I mean, you know, Janet Malcolm writes about this all the time. You know, it's and it's sometimes you feel, sometimes I feel as a journalist really conflicted about that. Sometimes I feel like a creep because I'm essentially trying to, you know, wheedle this information out of people, and it feels even stranger when you're doing it with a member of your own family. Um, in in terms of your second question. I, you know, I really struggled with with learning more about him because it made me feel partly responsible, and I know that's kind of dumb because I didn't do those things; he did. But in a sense, you know, when you learn that you're descended from a person who hurt a lot of people for a long time, you know, it makes you kind of question your own your own morality, your own sort of you know who you are, you know, your own sort of fiber. And you know, and it also made me, you know, once the epigenetic stuff came out, I did start to wonder, like, what, what am I, you know, what, what did I inherit from him, you know, what am I carrying around in my in my genetic code, you know, because after reading a bunch of, you know, one is a sense of guilt because obviously, he, you know, he, he hurt a lot of people and deprived a lot of people of their parents and siblings and you know spouses i don't i don't know the entirety of it but i know it was you know there were atrocities you know but i also having really immersed myself in reading a lot of psychology and the psychology of trauma it, as it turned out people who had committed atrocities during war in places like prisons actually ended up as traumatized as the victims because in their lives, they had the same propensity for PTSD, for you know, depersonalization, for you know, all kinds of schizoid symptoms as the victims. It, it turns out people don't really do well with being torturers and murderers. You know, it really takes a toll on you. You know, which maybe is not that surprising. We don't often feel sorry for those people because you know they are the they are the perpetrators, but. Um, but it's still a fact. So yeah, there was, I felt very guilty and I felt very weird for a long time, just to put it really simply, you know, after learning what he had, who he was and what he had done, because it really made me, you know, question my own, my own life, my own relationship to those events, you know? Um, and sometimes I felt guilty about living in peacetime America and going to like a nice liberal arts college I went to Oberlin and, you know, having this kind of really easy life, you know, in, in a way compared to my parents and my grandparents who really, you know, had it much harder. So, yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of real misgivings and a lot of, a lot of strangeness around this process. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I have one. I'm not sure if it's been answered, but um, hearing your recent uh, your response to Elizabeth's question, I was wondering um, 
since there was so since you felt uh, a lot of um, guilt in trying to um, uncover your grandfather's story, may I ask why your grandfather continued on um, telling his story and um, I guess the aftermath of having the story published? Um, do you mean do you mean the aftermath for him? Yes. Well, he passed away in 2008. So part of part of writing a book for 11 years about very old people is they may not live to see it. So um, he actually did not see the book. And um, so I, I don't know what his reaction to it would have been, you know. Um, it's getting translated into Russian. It hasn't yet. It's being translated into Polish. I don't know if it'll be translated into Ukrainian. But um, You know, it's interesting, the first part of your question, I think, and it kind of lies at the heart of journalism, right? Because often people will tell you things about themselves when you're interviewing them that really aren't in their best interest, where they're really putting themselves in a situation where they're, they're not, you know, it's like, why, and as a journalist, I often wonder, like, why are you telling me this? Like, you, you, you know, you know, I'm here to like, you know, write about your life and you know, a good journalist is a person who's, you know, who, who doesn't play favorites. You know, you're, as a journalist, your allegiance is always to getting a good story. And that good story, and then getting a good story usually means capturing someone in a kind of undefended state, you know, where, where they're really vulnerable and they're showing who they really are. You know, people, when they invite a journalist into their life, usually they, they have a press release version of themselves that they're trying to sell you, right? And they, and they really believe, I, I really think that they really believe in some part of themselves that that is going to be what happens, right? Because they really think that they're gonna convince you that they're this like completely whitewashed, you know, kind of like person who's, you know, a great contributor to science or, you know, a pioneering artist. And of course, as a journalist, you always wanna get under beyond the press release. You wanna like have a peek behind the curtain at the weirdness or the vulnerability or the, you know, or whatever strange things this person does. So, you know, with my grandfather, I think he kept telling me the story because he, right, so just to, just to finish that, sorry, I, I got sidetracked. I think people really wanna be known. Like in a weird way, people really tell these stories because they wanna be known and they want someone to know the truth about who they are. And sometimes that desire gets better of their self-preservation instinct, you know? Um, unless they're celebrities or really famous people, in which case they've done this so often that they're totally practiced at it and they're impregnable. But with somebody like my grandfather, I think he really wanted the story to be told. I think he really wanted me to know who he was. And I think sometimes even when he realized that he was telling me terrible things, like, you know, being there for that girl's abduction from the scene that I read, I think he continued talking because I think some, you know, he was an old man. He, he knew he wasn't going to be around for a very long time. And I don't think anybody had asked him about this part of his life in probably 40 years, you know, and here I was this grandson from America who suddenly showed up and I was like sitting there with a notebook and I was saying, tell me everything that that's happened to you. And I think, I think that really part of that really loved that, loved that, you know, he, he finally had a chance to tell his story, you know, and, and I, and so I think there's a real conflict in people who are being interviewed about self-preservation and, and preserving their, you know, their desire to be liked and approved of and their desire to actually tell their story as it really was. So I, I think, I think somehow in him, I mean, it didn't win out completely because he didn't tell me a lot. I mean, he didn't tell me as much as I wanted him to, but but I think that is does that answer or get at your question? That was very insightful. Thank you, and and my condolences. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick. Um, yeah, I just want to start with reiterating all the thank yous. Of course, it's been really great to hear from you, um, and. One thing that particularly caught my attention um, was the mention of the fact that from writing about your personal story and the story of your family, you were able to write sort of a broader history of sorts as well. And I'm wondering if in your writing process, um, any of it felt 
ethnographic likewise, or if you felt like in writing about the personal story that you were, um, that you were picking up on any cultural or social tendencies of the time, especially as things that people often view as sort of inherited phenomena as well? Wow, that's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think in, you know, I always thought of, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in, in a way, I think in any good work of nonfiction, you're trying to write about something larger than one person, right? Even when you're telling a very personal story, you're trying to capture something about the time and the place where this person lived, right? And about sort of the things that they felt as they are, as they exist in, the, in sort of the larger society. I think that's especially true when you're writing about the past, right? So a lot of these stories happened in places and times that I myself did not witness, you know, um, much of the book, in fact. So I very much tried to kind of weave in enough ethnography and history and kind of, you know, um, to, to give a sense of what the place was, who these people were, you know. I mean, you know, Jews living in Lithuania, for example, these were my mother's people, you know, had a very particular kind of culture and a very particular place in that society. So in a way, again, there was this balancing act between trying to really provide enough historical illumination to really, you know, put these people in a, you know, in a kind of richer, more resonant context to really tell the story of Litvox, you know, these Jews to tell the story of, you know, young people growing up in, in Moscow in the 70s, in the case of, in the 60s, sorry, in the case of my parents. But also being careful not to make them into you know, composites in, into these kinds of like, you know, archetypes, because they were very much unique people. And I very much wanted them to retain their individuality and not be stand-ins for social tendencies or ethnographic traits, right? So I think I very much, so it's, it was, it, it's, it's a balancing act. I think you have to, uh, you have to sort of be careful, but at the same time, you know, the best biographies that I've ever read and the best memoirs all are partly histories because you know it's always far more interesting when you when you have such a you know a historically kind of like illuminated and rich book where you really learn something about the place and the culture and how people lived at a time that you may not have been around for and and, and you know so I, I think I think that's incredibly important and I think you know because otherwise you just have a story of a person you know and and, and I think the extent, the ability to tie that person into larger, larger events, larger trends, larger ethnographies is what makes a nonfiction book really resonant and makes it really kind of of interest to other people. Because, you know, I think family memoirs, you know, the challenge for me is why should I care, right? Why, why should any of us care about somebody's family, right? Unless they're, you know, unless they were famous in some way. So I think for me, this was always kind of, kind of a history book masquerading as a memoir, if I can kind of push it to that extent, because I think that's where it gets really juicy and it gets really, really good, you know, where you can really start to talk about these larger things. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. I think we'll have time maybe for one more question. Are there any left? There we go. Uh, Wenping? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. I just have, a, a, can you comment on how you decide on the topic, the young heroes in the Soviet Union? Oh, you mean on the subject of the book? Yeah, the subject, uh, how you name the, the, you know, how you came about the title of the- Oh, you're, you're the asking book. about the title. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, got it, got it. Um, so uh, the title of the book actually comes from a book that I had as a, uh, as a grade, grade school uh, student in the Soviet Union. So we had this book um, that first graders were made to read in, in, you know, 
pretty much in every school in, in the Soviet Union because it was a centralized system. So, you know, in every, every public school and there were no other kinds of schools, uh, we read this book called Pioneer uh, Giroi in Russian, which means pioneers, heroes, which I sort of, which made it a little bit more understandable in English by calling it Young Heroes of the Soviet Union. And what this book was, was a, it was a picture book because it was for seven-year-olds of young, of, of actually children and teenagers who had given their lives for their country. So, so to make that clear, children and teenagers who were killed by Tsarist white troops or by Nazis. So, and, th and this very much kind of for me captures the absurdity of the Soviet Union, right? Because you have these seven-year-olds and they're ma being made to read about children, often children their own age who were murdered, right? For, you know, essentially for, you know, performing these heroic acts. Um, I mean, imagine a book like that in America, right? I mean, people would lose their mind, but, and, and often these were illustrations. The illustrations were of these children dying, you know? Wow. So, and, and this to me really symbolized something about the Soviet Union in the sense that it was really, the idea of that book was that you were not important. What was important was the collective. What was important was, you know, the cause of communism and the cause of the Soviet Union, right? Because the best thing you could do in your life was to die for your country. So it was very much like, in a way, you know, the stories of the Catholic saints. And that struck me as a really kind of symbolic book about the, the Soviet Union, right? Because it was like, it was, it was, it was essentially, you know, the idea that you're constantly being taught in, in the Soviet Union was that what mattered was the country, what mattered was the society, what mattered was the cause of the proletariat and the communist system, and that you're in, you as an individual didn't matter. But of course, the actual society of the Soviet Union was often quite different. It was often about things like connections and, you know, all the, all the, you know, the same things that is anywhere else. So um, it struck me as a kind of absurd and fun title to get, to give this book because it, it really is, is a title that has to do with, you know, I think it's both kind of ironic and, and in a way, you know, serious, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of about what was expected of a person growing up in that country and living in that country and the kind of like psychological mindset that was encouraged. So I thought it was, and I like the idea of naming a book for another book. I think mm. that's kind of cool. So that's how I came up with the title. Great, that makes perfect sense because that also, I think that draws some resemblance to the Chinese context, like the Cultural Revolution, the Absolutely. collectivism there. Yeah, so I can recognize that because we have a term for that in Chinese. Uh, not, you know, almost like young heroes. You are yeah. like, you are destructive and you are doing bad things, but you have a very good title. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. um, this, the, the cover of the book is, is a um, painting oh. by, by my stepfather, <laughs> a guy named Vitaly Komar, who Jose has met, who was, mm -hmm. and essentially this was uh, a parody of socialist realism, which was the official painting style of the Soviet Union, which of course, you know, and I know that one of the things that the Soviet Union shared with China during the Cultural Revolution. Yes, I was, think we copied that. Realism, yeah. <laughs> it I, looks I, very I, familiar to it me. Looks, yeah, yeah. So, so <laughs> it's, you know, it has very much the same kind of, you know, I think we grew up with similar propaganda. Yeah, the I'm, mentality I'm, there. Yeah, the mm -hmm. same mentality. So thank you mm -hmm. for that question. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for this yeah, reading. For the, yeah. um, I'm going to give a clap. I invite others to clap, heart, whatever <laughs> you feel like. <laughs> it was really wonderful. Um, and I'll just remind people if you are on campus or near campus, or maybe we can work it some other way. Um, if you want a copy, let me know. I really have a bunch. And as much as I like the book, I really don't need an entire box full of them. So, are you sure? Well, <laughs> I'm happy to share. That's the, main, that's the main thing. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I will need a copy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>